Good afternoon. Stephanie, are you ready for me to begin? Very good. I'd like to welcome everybody who is joined from the public and our and our panelists today um, for our very first public meeting under the O'Donnell Consent Decree. Um, what I'm going to do is, Stephanie, if you could go to the next screen for today's agenda. This thing here. I am Jim Bethke, the director of the Justice Administration Department. Um, today is our one year anniversary. Our department um, opened for business on October 28th last year. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to provide just a little bit of an overview of our office's role um, under the O'Donnell Consent Decree. Then we'll hear from Professor Garrett and Professor Thompson, our federal court monitors. Um, we'll also hear um, from a representative, Rachel Frazier, from the county attorney's office. And we'll hear from Major Doherty and Victoria Jimenez from the Harris County Sheriff's Office. And then we'll close out the panelists with um, presiding judge Cedric Walker of the county criminal courts at law. We're anticipating the, um, the panelists to, in, in total to spend about 30 minutes, and that'll leave us about 60 minutes for questions and answers. And we really do look forward to the questions we get and the feedback that we get from y'all. Um, regarding the questions and answers, um, or the questions, you can, what my staff has recommended is to send your questions via the chat. And then once um, Judge Walker finishes, um, Brianna Cummings will then post the, the questions to the panelists and then whichever the panelist wants to answer will will answer. So um, with that, Stephanie, if you had turned the screen. Um, as I mentioned, our department was um, began operations a year ago, and our mission is really to bring stakeholders together to facilitate meaningful improvements throughout the Harris County justice system that ensures public safety, fairness, equity, efficiency, accountability, so that all Harris County residents can live in a safe, healthy, and thriving communities. One of our big responsibilities is we are tasked with the implementation of the O'Donnell Consent Decree, um, working very closely with um, both Professor Garrett, Professor Thompson, county criminal courts, the sheriff's office, county attorneys, um, and other other key stakeholders. Um, next screen. This is the kind of the 10,000 foot overview. Um, Professor Garrett will get into uh, much greater detail, but the impetus of today's meeting began in 2016 when a class action lawsuit was filed by the plaintiffs, um, Alec Karakastanis and Elizabeth Rossi, the, the plaintiff's attorney. Um, and they alleged that the, uh, the bail practice in Harris County for misdemeanor arrestees was unconstitutional. Um, after months um, and months of um, talks, um, the parties did reach a settlement. The parties in the, the lawsuit, of course, was, was the, the county, um, the, 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 the sheriff um, and the county criminal courts and, 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 and the plaintiffs. The settlement was reached and the consent decree outlines the, the required changes that the county um, has made and will continue to make to its judicial processes. With that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Professor Garrett and Professor Thompson. They began um, their work on early March, on March 3rd um, of 2020. Since then, we've been, we've met with them on at least once a week on a, on a regular meeting with all the parties and on various other aspects, probably sometimes um, two to three times a week, um, working really closely with, with our data team, um, the amount of effort and time that they've spent with us, um, the stakeholders and others has um, been quite frankly amazing. And um, we're delighted that they are serving as our, our federal court monitors. And with that, I'll hand it over to Professor Garrett. Well, 
Well, it's really a pleasure to to have this opportunity to to meet with you all, and thank you, Jim, and thank you to everyone at JAD for all the hard work that you did to organize this meeting. It's not as easy to all get together during COVID as it would be otherwise, but I hope we can make this as participatory as possible. And I really hope that all of you who are watching this um, don't just sit and listen to us, but please send us your questions. We really want your feedback. We want to answer your questions. And so, you know, my comments will, will not be too long. Uh, Sandy and I are thrilled to be partnering together doing this work. And like Jim suggested, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes 10 meetings a week, uh, although virtually, um, it, there's, there's a lot to do. And that said, there's been incredible work done already to create the architecture of this misdemeanor bail reform in Harris County, which is already a, a model for the nation, but we have work to do to implement this fully and to put the rest of the architecture in place. So to give you an overview, um, Sandy and I were appointed as, as court appointed monitors in the first week of March. And so we'd certainly learned a lot about the consent decree and met with the parties, read the document very, very carefully, many dozens of times before we started. Um, we also started at a inopportune time, right? The first cases of COVID reached the Harris County jails basically then, you know, early on in March. Um, we uh, began our work promptly and immediately began doing both formal analysis of data that we began to receive from the county and also a lot of our own hand collection and observation, which I'll say a little bit about. Uh, but first I wanted to just say something about our team and have Sandy introduce you to our even broader team. Our narrower team consists of Sandy and I and some others. So I'm, I'm a law professor. I teach at Duke Law School. I work a lot with researchers despite being a lawyer without a scientific background. Sandy and I have known each other for many years because of our work together on some issues related to both eyewitness evidence and forensic science, including work with the Houston Forensic Science Center, whose board Sandy has sat on. Um, also on our team, is Dottie Carmichael at Texas A&M and particularly at their Public Policy Research Institute. And her team is integral to our work in two different ways. The first way is that they are assisting constantly with the project management aspects of this work. And the project management at the counties on the county side has also been just superlative. There are a lot of deadlines. There are a lot of deliverables. There are a lot of details because this is a, a, an agreement that lasts, um, you know, our monitorship last seven years, the agreement uh, is a long-term agreement. And that project management has been intensive at times. Uh, so we've been incredibly grateful to have the partnership with the folks at PPRI at Texas A&M. A second piece of their work, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit as well, has to do with a broader look at the cost and benefits of this misdemeanor bail reform. And not just sort of simplistically in terms of how many jail cells are filled or how many people with misdemeanor complaints come back into the system, but broader social costs on the community and certainly the budgets of the relevant agencies. And, and that work has begun and will be incredibly important as we evaluate how well this is working. Other collaborators include Dr. Songman Kang, who has been invaluable in his help analyzing the data. Uh, a lot of the figures and tables that you see in our Monitor report are, are, are thanks to him. Um, and uh, we also have a broader group that has been advising us regularly throughout this process. So I want to turn things over to Sandy to introduce to you our community working group and our work throughout this process to get feedback, to run questions by, and to collaborate with community stakeholders. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Um, as you noted, I'm a professor at Um, and I've been a Houston resident for the last 30 years. Um, and like Brandon, um, in that time, I've reached out. Um, and, you know, because of the great 
to you know, I'm glad to be a part of this team. For many years, I had uh, been doing advocacy in Austin, um, as well as in Houston, around the issue of bail and the impact that uh, that money bail had on poor people. Uh, make the money or not, uh, there were implications for um, the working poor and and groups like the homeless and foster children. Real concern to me for years. Um, to be part of the team, I have to say that working, you know, knowing the kind of folks we were going to be working with, um, as well as the bench, um, and across, you know, all the other stakeholders, the sheriff's office. Um, the public defender, the defense the district attorney across the board in Harris County. I think we have some very strong that have really shown a commitment to um, working with us in this um, fundamental transformation of the pretrial justice system in one of the largest counties in the country. So it's really amazing what's as to eleven members. Uh, in our community working group. This is a diverse group of uh, individuals who are leaders in the community in different capacities. Um, we, have, uh, we have someone who works directly with the homeless. We have someone representing the downtown business community. We have uh, uh, someone who works with uh, victims of sex trafficking, of uh, domestic violence, immigrants, foster children. Uh, we have several retired who are top brass at HPD. Um, we have civil rights advocates as well as individuals with personal experience going through the criminal justice system to sexual violence. Um, and so it's it's a group that uh, brings a lot of um, a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge about our community and about the issues that um, this very comprehensive consent decree addresses. Um, and we've met six times with them uh, by now, uh, bringing various county officials. We've talked, uh, we've gotten regarding that community engagement, how to reach broader Houston area community. Um, we as concerned about ethnicity. In Harris County, um, uh, in gender and um, next month, um, in particular, the informed training uh, for county officials, um, as well as um, in value in arranging other community meetings. Um, so we have met now with uh, a large group of individuals who represent um, addicts and service providers uh, for survivors of domestic violence. Um, we've listened to their concerns and, and gathered more um, insights about the concerns of that. Uh, we've also uh, had a very large with the advocate and service providers for foster veterans, um, you know, individuals with health and uh, drug issues, etc. Um, and once again, we learn much, a great deal um, in, in those. Donald consent. Um, about improving uh, our service. Um, uh, avoid. Uh, having to fail and and stepping into other programs um, that might help them turn their lives around. 
Um, so very encouraged, and I think things that that were translations um, into languages of things like court notices and uh, other forms. Possibilities, um, enormous progress. Time. A lot of um, in transit. So, um, you know, we're looking forward to continuing this work in the years to come. A lot of progress that we will be seeing. Thank you so much, Sandy. I'm back and unmuted. Um, we uh, certainly don't see our community working group as a substitute for comments from the public. So please, please again, send in your questions and comments as as we present to you. I did talk for just a few more minutes because I know we're running out of time. Um, our first six months of work, I was described in a Long report, it's available on a website. We have a monitor website. It's also on the county's website. It was filed with the, with the federal judge that oversees this consent decree. Just to give you an overview of the highlights. Um, well, we created a monitor website. We completed our report. We convened the community working group. Uh, there was plenty of work to do that involved providing feedback on different policy improvements, decisions that the county made in terms of documents to share with the public. Um, all that structural work is described in the report. We also had some initial data that we were able to analyze and present some results on. Uh, some of it was hand collected. You know, we were watching videos of hearings. Um, we were uh, writing, copying down the text of hearing officer rulings. And so doing basically informal court watching to watch the misdemeanor process and get a sense of what was happening in cases. Uh, there's still a lot of data analysis work that is still in progress. Uh, but what we had was about five years of data on the misdemeanor docket in Harris County. So going back to 2015, what we described is that there's been a modest decline in the number of misdemeanor complaints each year. Back in 2015, it was more than 60,000 cases per year. It was down to about 50,000 by last year. This year may be quite a bit lower, but for COVID related reasons. Um, the share during that time of cases where a bond was approved and not a secured bond, a cash bond, where someone might end up in the jail because they can't afford it, but rather a personal or general order bond which results in the person's release to the community. That share has steadily climbed and it went up much more so after rule nine took effect, which was the new rule that the County Criminal Court of Law judges adopted in February, 2019. That rule was then incorporated into this consent decree. Uh, and so, you know, some of the analyses we presented in our report is, well, what happened before and after Rule 9 was adopted, this important change in how misdemeanor cases are handled in Harris County. The main change, there are a lot of changes, but one big aspect of it is that for most misdemeanor offenses, a person is entitled to a general order bond at the point of booking and is released. For certain other offenses, which are called carve out offenses that are comparatively more serious, uh, like repeat uh, drunken driving off offense, a domestic violence offense, then the person is not automatically entitled to a general order bond. Instead, they have a hearing, but a much more robust hearing than in the past. They, they will be represented by a public defender, so there's a lawyer there, and the a hearing officer must find by clearing convincing evidence that this there's no other alternative uh, to, uh, to an unaffordable bond if the goal is to detain the person, or they can find that you know, there's no other alternative to certain types of community su supervision if the person is work involved reading those opinions, getting a sense of how these hearings were proceeding and were they living up to the rigorous standards set out in the consent decree. Uh, we also reported on what the outcomes look like big picture and we described how the uh, 
number of jail days that people are spending is dramatically reduced. Far more people are receiving bond and released to the community. We also looked at how many misdemeanor complainants uh, are brought in on a new complaint within 90 days, 180 days, and an, an entire year. And what we describe is that there is no change in that rate of new complaints during this time period before and after these reforms were adopted. We also looked at how often is it a new felony complaint or just the number of new complaints per person. And again, no, no change. Um, perhaps not surprising to those who had always thought that bill reform was a good idea and that uh, even before these reforms, it's not like people in misdemeanor cases spent lots and lots of time in the jail. There was great pressure to plead guilty to get out of the jail if you were in jail because you couldn't afford a cash bond. And so average jail stays, we show, you know, were much longer before bail reform, but they weren't that long, you know, 10 to 14 days. Uh, there's important work that we haven't done. So we are just now starting to get and examine data concerning, well, what happens in cases after magistrate or someone is released on bond? What happens as these cases proceed in the courts? Uh, there are other aspects of this consent decree which are incredibly important and are and will be implemented in the months to come. So as a preview of what's to come, you know, the, the kind of criminal judges have adopted a new set of court appearance policies that were set out in the consent decree, but work is being done to implement those policies. Some of that implementation has been done. There is now an open hours court, for example, where people can come in person and reschedule court dates. The sort of data end, though, to actually record these new categories. The, the goal is to make it very clear when people are required to be in court and when the court dates can be rescheduled. So people know uh, when they have to be there, when they don't, and what the rules are. Uh, there is also a new court notification system with the goal of making sure that people get the reminders like we do when we go to the dentist uh, so that we people don't inadvertently forget about court dates and cause inconvenience to themselves and, and to the court. That process is, is being designed and developed, and that will happen over the next few months. So those are really important changes to come. Uh, we noted in the report that uh, some initial calculations regarding just detention and jail cost, which is just one sliver of the cost that we're looking at in terms of assessing how well this is working. Uh, and, and we describe how there's been a modest decline in jail cost, but not as great a decline as you'd expect given many, many more people in the community. We did note that there's a small group of people, a very small subset, but that in that small subset, average jail days have increased quite a bit, and that's offsetting some of the cost savings. And that's something that we will, we will be exploring further. Uh, so that's, that, that's my big overview. We have a lot of work to do, and there's some really important pieces of this consent decree which are being implemented as we speak. And so there'll be a lot of exciting news to report to next time we meet, both in terms of implementation and our, our data work and our evaluation. But we are extremely excited to be able to share what's happened so far. We think that it's already really, really exciting progress and really, really important, both for those of us in Harris County and those of us around the country. We appreciate your time, Sandy and Brandon, today um, for going over that with us. And they will be sticking around to the end. If we have additional questions, um, they'll be more than happy to answer it for us. Next up, we have Rachel Frazier from our county attorney's office. Good afternoon. I'm from the Harris, Harris County Attorney's Office, and our office represents the county, its department, elected and appointed officials, and employees in civil matters that involve all sorts of county business. Our office also represents other departments within Harris County. If you can advance the slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about criminal justice system reform in Houston, which is the nation's third largest county and has long been supported by both Harris County elected officials and local taxpayers who have paid to make the massive system more responsive to a diverse population, which is expected to explode to 5.6 million by the year 2025. In 2017, Harris County hired its first racial disparity and fairness administrator as part of MacArthur Foundation grant. 
And this post will focus on racial and ethnic disparity in the justice system and improve communication between the county and community, especially in communities of color. Also in 2017, and again, thanks to the MacArthur Foundation grant, Harris County hired its first ever in custody population coordinator. Now, this post will monitor the inmate population and ensure that the county is using community based programs and other avenues to keep the low level offenders out of long term detention. The person in this position is also going to make sure that policymakers are using the best tools they can and data to fight recidivism. So, the O'Donnell consent decree. The county attorney's office actively participates with the federal court monitor on a regular basis and plaintiff's counsels on the changes being implemented across all county agencies. We are the legal resource for administering all requests for proposals, and we also provide guidance on data and information sharing to support the transparency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that oversight. Next, we'll have our representatives from the Sheriff's Department. First, we will have Victoria Jimenez. She is the Director of Legal Services. And then we'll have Major Patrick Dory. Thank you. Thank you, Bree. My name is Victoria Jimenez. I'm the Legal Director here at the Harris County Sheriff's Office. And I've been the Legal Director here at the Sheriff's Office since March of 2020. Uh, I've been at Harris County since 2008, and prior to being the legal director here at the Sheriff's Office, I was in the Harris County Attorney's Office in the litigation division. In August of 2018, I performed a dual role. I was general counsel for the Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences that houses the medical examiner and the crime lab, and I also had some litigation cases. Um, I have been involved with the O'Donnell case since the sheriff came into the office in 2017. I was one of his two attorneys that helped litigate the case for him. Thus, I've been heavily involved with the conception and the implementation of the consent decree as it pertains to the sheriff's office and the jail. The biggest change for the sheriff's office regarding the O'Donnell case and the consent decree has been the processing of the general order bonds that Mr. Garrett was telling you about earlier for the misdemeanor arrestees. But with that, I'm gonna introduce Major uh, Doherty and he can expand a little bit about the, the biggest change regarding the O'Donnell case and the consent decree as far as the Sheriff's Office and the jail is concerned. Major Doherty, um, it, he leads the Justice Management Bureau here at the Sheriff's Office. He came to the county in January of 2017 after retiring from the Houston Police Department after 36 years of service. He is one of my all time favorite mentors, uh, teaches me a lot about law enforcement. So I will let him take the mic and tell and explain to you the biggest changes with the Sheriff's Office and the consent degree regarding the Sheriff's Office and the jail. Good afternoon. As Victoria said, my name is uh, Patrick Doherty. I'm the major over the Justice Management Bureau, which runs the Joint Processing Center. The Joint Processing Center is the center where all arrestees in Harris County come. They come through the doors here and then they leave. They go back to the community through the Joint Processing Center. Therefore, I'm, I'm very involved in the, the bond reform, how, how it operates in my facility. Uh, most of the arrestees who have to go see a judge will see a judge here. They're charged while they're in my building. Uh, once the charge is done, the newest thing to the bond reform is the general order bonds where we can process those people out quickly. Uh, the most significant thing that the community needs to know is the Harris County Jail is the third largest jail in America. And right now we're about 94% full. And the bond reform has helped us use our resources as efficiently as possible to keep those in jail that need some protection, the community needs protection from them, and they're more serious violent violators of the law. So the bond reform has helped us 
quite honestly, in our population from getting out of hand. Uh, we process people in approximately 300 a day prior to COVID and process out approximately 300 people a day out through various uh, legal orders, bonds, and judgments of the court. That's about all I have to say. We appreciate you, Sheriff's Department, for reporting out on the progress you've made throughout this bail reform. Next up, we have our county criminal courts at law, who's going to be represented by presiding Judge Walker. Thank you. My name is Judge Cedric Walker. I'm the presiding judge of Harris County Criminal Court at Law Number 11. I'm also currently serving as the presiding judge of the Harris County Misdemeanor Criminal Courts, which we have 16 you know, county criminal courts in Harris County that all have jurisdiction over misdemeanor uh, criminal offenses. Um, the first thing I kind of want to go through is some of the milestones uh, and benchmarks that have been reached uh, in terms of bail reform, not only the consent decree, but some other things that we've done in the past you know, year and a half, so to speak. So first local rule nine went into play on February 16, 2019. Local rule nine is essentially the rule that put into play the system of uh, unsecured bonds being the primary uh, basis or for release in Harris County for misdemeanor cases uh, for, for most misdemeanor arrestees. As Brandon said earlier, there are some people that uh, don't get an automatic uh, unsecured bond and have a hearing with a uh, judicial officer while they're in custody and then will come to the county criminal court at law presiding judge if that person is not not given a unsecured bond by the hearing officer uh, local rule nine is also incorporated within the consent decree itself but it has been in effect since february of last year the o'donnell consent decree was signed by judge rosenthal on uh, November 22nd, 2019. And as Brandon's discussed, we've been going through the process of implementing that since, um, you know, I guess August essentially of last year. I'm sorry, this year. Uh, also, the site and release program we have is not incorporated within the consent decree, but it plays a big factor in the topic of bail reform as a whole. Site and release is a program that allows law enforcement agencies to issue citations to uh, people who are arrested or charged with uh, certain offenses, misdemeanor offenses. And instead of being booked into the jail, they are then given a citation and given a court date to appear at a later time, rather than being booked into jail, potentially having their vehicles towed or you're know, losing any other kind of uh, things they may have at that time frame and avoiding a uh, jail stay, so to speak. There are certain offenses that this applies to, certain theft cases, criminal mischief cases, graffiti cases, uh, certain controlled substances offenses. But again, it allows a significant uh, number of people to be kept out of the jail. Um, the sheriff's office has been on board with the program really from the outset. The Houston Police Department, obviously, which is probably the, the biggest agency in our county, certainly has jumped on board here in the last a month or two. So we expect the increase in those cases to go up substantially and further, you know, help keep people out of custody that don't necessarily need to be there. The other thing we've implemented that's been a big change, obviously, from the, the past um, years down here at the courthouse is the open hours court, which is implemented in September of 2020. That is a program that is provided by the consent decree that says that folks who have an a warrant for non-appearance may come to a designated court every Thursday uh, to ask for a reset of their court date. They can appear in that designated court, which may be one of one of any one of the 16, depending on the rotation for that week, or the person can appear in their assigned court uh, if that court is available to ask for a reset of their court date if they have a warrant for non-appearance. There are some scenarios in which uh, a person uh, will have their warrant removed and get a reset. There are some other scenarios in which that may not necessarily happen, but a hearing has to be held first before the judge can make a decision on whether uh, to you know, not uh, clear the warrant, so to speak. Have the next slide, please. Thank you. 
So what we've also done is made more of a concerted effort to waive court appearances when appropriate. Now, the COVID-19 situation has kind of really dictated that for us, so to speak. But I will say we were trending in that direction anyways. Uh, as those who have been experiencing the criminal justice system may know for years past, it was very common for courtrooms to be packed, potentially with you know, 50, 60 people in the courtroom at one time. Certainly now with COVID, we can't do that, you know, for, for uh, health reasons, certainly. But even before that, a lot of courts were trending towards waiving appearances anyways, because the early stages of a case, it's not really necessary to be uh, in court all the time. Uh, we modified our court date not notification forms to indicate whether an appearance is required or not. Again, we're, for waiving appearances, we want people to know for sure, hey, your appearance is waived versus no, you do have to be here. We posted the court setting guidelines and procedures on our county court at law website. Uh, we're developing a web based option for the defense attorneys and the arrestees to uh, request or facilitate a request for a court date. And we're working with justice partners to develop a phone and email notification system for upcoming and missed court appearances. And we're updating the county systems to clearly indicate that a general order bond, which is an unsecured bond, is a personal bond for which the underlying amount is you know, unsecured. Next slide, please. So, as you can see by this chart, and Brandon's mentioned it in his comments earlier, that the stay in custody for misdemeanor arrestees has severely dropped. 2015, zero to one day stay was only just over half of the uh, number of arrestees. And now through Jan June 30th of 2020, that's all the way up to 87%. So the new rules and the consent decree is keeping a lot of people uh, out of custody and they're not spending nearly as much time as they were under the, the old system. Uh, next slide, please. And also you'll see that from 2015 to 2020, there's been a drastic increase in the use of unsecured bonds versus secured bonds and also a drastic uh, decrease in the number of people who don't get a bond at any point or don't post the bond at any point during um, before their case is disposed. So we've allowed people to get out of custody, go back to work, school, uh, talk with their attorneys about the case before they make a decision on what they want to do and not necessarily have to rush into doing a plea just to get out of jail. Um, but again, thank you all for, for your time today and I appreciate any comments or questions. Do you have thank you so much, Judge Walker. We appreciate your time and your guidance throughout this process. Next up, we're gonna have actually our plaintiff's attorney, Elizabeth Rossi, who's gonna provide us some further information about the progress of the O'Donnell consent decree. Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much Bree, and uh, thanks to you and, and Jim for, and uh, uh, Brandon of course and Sandy for coordinating this. Um, meeting. I don't have too much to add. I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Elizabeth Rossi and I'm counsel for the plaintiff class in the O'Donnell litigation. Um, I'm really excited and pleased about the uh, progress so far uh, in implementing the consent decree. This is a landmark settlement with a lot of really exciting um, uh, components of it and it's a complex system to, to change and of course the some of the practices and the, the culture within the system is extremely entrenched and has been um, sort of how things have been done for, for a really long time. And so I've been really pleased to see the, uh, you know, enthusiasm and commitment of folks in the, the county and the sheriff's office and the judges and the hearing officers in implementing the consent decree. Um, and I'm grateful to Brandon and Sandy for their very hard work um, and diligence in uh, coordinating a lot of different people within the Harris County system. Um, there's definitely a lot of work left to be done. There are you know, key aspects of the consent decree that have yet to be implemented. There are aspects of rule nine, the sort of cornerstone bail policy of the new, of the new uh, system, which are you know, not fully um, being complied with yet. But I will say that, that we're all working together in order to make that happen. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I've been pleased with the collaborative nature of the, of the project so far and look forward to continuing. Um, and that's all I'll say for now. I really think it's uh, most important for you all to hear from the um, different defendant groups and then also uh, have everyone's questions answered. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for jumping on, and we are happy to work with you as well. We did have a, a couple of questions that were posed. The first one, and panelists, feel free to jump in um, if you would like to answer any of these questions. Carol said, I thought I heard Brandon Garrett say some of misdemeanor defendants are detained. How's this achieved without a statute that allows preventative detention? Yeah, and the quick answer there is that uh, there is no such a person can only be detained in the jail if they hear finding that the only way by clear and convincing evidence to assure public safety and with no other lesser, least restrictive alternatives, um, being able to make that assurance uh, imposes a cash uh, bond amount, a secured bond amount that the person cannot afford. And so it is only through an unaffordable cash bond that the person can be can be detained. Uh, and uh, I think there's a related question about uh, what role financial bail has in the system now. So financial bail does still exist. If someone is indigent, they cannot be no financial condition under the consent decree, unless there is this very strong evidence, evidence. It's a clear and convincing standard, which means uh, very strong evidence, not beyond a reasonable doubt, but really strong uh, evidence that this is needed. Uh, to assure appearance, to assure that public safety is met. Can I can I just add to that, Brandon, if that's okay? Please. Um, yeah, of course. So I just wanted to um, make one distinction. One is that the federal lawsuit that we brought raised claims only other, under the federal constitution. So we argued under the 14th Amendment that um, you can't detain someone pretrial without a robust hearing, counsel, and a factual finding on the on the record that detention is necessary. Um, and we didn't bring a claim, although I think uh, in another case you, you could. Constitution prohibits the detention of misdemeanors ever. Um, and so that means that the consent decree really only speaks to what the federal constitution authorizes or permits and what it prohibits. And because we didn't argue um, that misdemeanors could never be detained, there is a, a, a way under the consent decree and under rule nine um, that consistent with the consent decree and rule nine, people can be detained uh, pretrial as misdemeanors. And the consent decree and, and rule nine, again, take no position on what Texas law might permit. Um, I think I agree with you. Uh, Ms. Oler, that under Texas law, uh, you probably can't use unaffordable bail to detain people. But again, that wasn't part of the claims in this lawsuit. And so when we're talking about the consent decree and rule nine and what's authorized under federal constitution, that's why um, that's why Professor Garrett is, has referred to people being detained pretrial um, using unaffordable bail. And then I also just wanna say that, the, that rule nine cabins the use of secured bail. So for the vast majority of people, um, who are arrested, secured bail can't be used as a condition of release at all. There are certain categories of people for whom hearing officers or judges can consider requiring secured bail. And for everyone else, um, Rule 9 prohibits secured bail as a condition of release at all. Thank you so much to both of you for answering that question. Carol did have an additional question that I wanted to um, give to you all. Has there been an increase in the use of conditions that can potentially set defendants up for technical failures? Is this being monitored? So I'll say as, as monitor data that we would like on what the different financial or non-bond related conditions are. So how many people have a protective order or drug testing and the like. Um, you know, indigent people are not to be assessed with costs or fees for any such conditions. And that's a really important and positive requirement of this consent decree. Uh, but it's a area which we want to do more modeling and observation. One way in which there are certainly just by definition more opportunities for failure is that, you know, um, 
the pre-bail reform days in Harris County, someone might be detained in the jail because they couldn't afford bond in a petty case, and they would plead guilty after 10 days, 14 days in the jail. Like what Judge Walker showed in his slide, you know, there are many more people in the jail for 10 or 14 days, but they would often plead guilty because it was the only way to get out. Um, now, cases proceed towards the, the merits, uh, but to actually bring a case potentially towards a misdemeanor trial, maybe many months. And so whatever conditions are imposed may be in place for many more months because cases are now going forward. And so I think it is important to look at whether the conditions are the right ones. The consent decree speaks to imposing the least restrictive conditions, the conditions that are needed. Uh, and, and that's something that we plan to, to study carefully. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's a really important topic. We, I, I wish we could tell you more about it, but it's one of these areas where we're just beginning to get the information that we would need to get a sense of the practices. And Bree, this is Jim. And one follow up to Professor Garrett is we there is a study that is being that that is being considered and, and taken a look at. So we're really hoping that study will help be able to address that specific question. You're muted. Bree, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so I'll actually ask the next question. It says it was actually directed to Judge Walker, but it says, tell us the failure to appear rates among those released on unsecured bond versus those released on a secured bond. And so as we previously discussed, we're still researching data um, to get that. The slide that he shows only took us to June 30th, so we still have time to analyze and validate that data. Um, so we would not be able to give a definitive answer on that right now. If I'm missing something, um, panelists, feel free to jump in. No, Bree, I would agree with you. I think we need more uh, numbers on that to, to kind of make definitive conclusions one way or the other uh, regarding, you know, the difference between uh, you know, the unsecured versus the secured bonds. Also, COVID-19, particularly for 2020, has really, really changed appearances just in general as a whole. So for the last, you know, what, six, seven months, data would be hard to interpret, I believe, uh, anyways. But I, but I think, as you said, uh, Ms. Cummings, that, you know, we need some more numbers on that to, to make a, a definitive statement about what the difference between the two is. All right, and that takes us, um, it looks like we're running out of questions. Um, if you look in the chat session also, Elizabeth Rossi has answered some of the questions that are being posed, which is our plaintiff's attorney. I'm gonna go down. Okay, how does the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling that defendants are, have no right to be free from a wealth-based detention factor into implementation? And if you look down, uh, Mario, Elizabeth has answered. It says the fact that Rule 9 authorizes pre-child detention using unaffordable bail is consistent with the Fifth, Cir Fifth Circuit's ruling that there is no right to be free from any form of wealth-based detention. All right, and those are all the questions that we had at that time. If there was anything else that the panelists would like to close out and to say um, at the community meeting, feel free to do so. If not, we'll conclude the meeting. All right, well, thank you so much. I would like to thank my boss and our director, Jim Becky. He's the director of Harris County Justice Administration Department. Professor Brandon Garrett, who's our federal court monitor, our deputy monitor, Sandra Guerrero Thompson, our representative from the county attorney's office, Rachel Frazier, the director of legal services of the Harris County Sheriff's Office, Victoria Jimenez, Patrick, I'm sorry, Major Patrick Doherty from the Sheriff's Department, and our presiding judge, Judge Cedric Walker. Thank you all for your time. Additionally, if we didn't answer your questions or if you have further things, feel free to reach out to us on our social platforms. We do have our JAD website that contains the consent decree that also can connect you to the six month report and all of the updates that have been happening in the O'Donnell consent decree. Please like us on Facebook, 
Twitter, and then also if you would like to contact our monitors directly, they have a website below. Any additional questions or concerns can be directed to events at jad.hctx.net. We appreciate your time and also this will be happening every six months. So please make sure that we got your correct email addresses. So for the next, so for our next meeting that all of you all can be present again. And if you have any further questions, we can answer it at that time. We appreciate your time today and have a great afternoon.